Okay, I'm, I know I'm covering a lot of different divergent um, pieces of information, but all this is very, there's a lot more that's interesting, I'll tell you that. But nonetheless, there is some evidence that may or may not have anything to do with Charles Morton's life that I am going to go into, and that has to do with his the death of his grandson through uh, Charles Kerr Morton. And of course, uh, we don't know if it was a natural grandson or not. Uh, again, DNA is going to help sort that out, so I'm going to follow up on that when I do it, but it's probably going to take a good six months, but I better, better get on my, <laughs> better get on the horn and order the thing before um, tax season rolls around and then I'm in the bunkers <laughs> 24 hours a day for the next four months. Okay, so I'm going to go over here to, um, let's go back here, I was looking at Elizabeth Pratt, and I'll go back to um, Charles Morton and I'll pick unknown, unknown the spouse. Probably should have Charles Kerr disconnected, but what have you. Um, here's Charlie Tallow, and here's Charles Morton. Okay, so uh, Charles Kerr got married again in 1799 at the residence of John Tatlow. That's the father of Charlotte Tatlow. That's the individual whose memoirs I had gone over recently <clears throat> before I went into a little bit on Dr. Morton's will. And uh, first two children was Anna, second was Mary Ann. Anna died almost immediately. She was born premature. According to John Tatlow, uh, Mary Ann died uh, single, basically. She lived with her sister, um, Janetta, up until about the time she died. And then here's a Charles, so he's the oldest male, and usually the oldest male, the ones in uh, England that would inherit the bulk of the estate. <coughs> Born in 1802, it shows him dying in 1832. And of course, Pierce Morton outlived him to um, 1859. <coughs> now, there's a very interesting account of his death that I found in a newspaper archive. I think it may have even been newspaperarchive.com or something like that. And there are actually two newspaper articles, and there's actually a coroner's inquest about this. And I included some of this content in the Wikipedia page for Charles Morton because there's some ancillary evidence in it that could perhaps have something to do with Dr. Morton's ancestry, which is still yet to be solved. Okay, so I'm just going to go over and just pretty much read what I have here because I don't really, I really don't know a whole heck of a lot about about this Charles Morton. Unfortunately, there isn't much record of him that's available, uh, that's outside of archives and in downloadable format that an internet researcher such as myself can do. I've gotten awfully far with that, but <clears throat> eventually I'm going to want to get to the Irish National Library to get a little more information about Charles Morton. Uh, one point when he was the head of, um, after Charles Kerr died, I suppose in 1819, between 1819 and 1832, Charles Morton was the proprietor of um, Kilnacrop. <coughs> Although um, there was never an entry made for Charles Morton in, in the land of gentry until such time that Pierce was the head of the family. Okay, so let's go for this. Um, so this is, this is what he wrote. His namesake, Charles Morton, 1802-1832, I wrote committed suicide. I, I have some question about that, but then again... Um, that was the official ruling, so that's what I wrote. As reported in the London Times on October 3rd, 1832, and Baldwin's London Weekly Journal in Surrey and Sussex Gazette on October 6th, 1832. And I'm just going to read the accounts that were, that were there. Fortunately, I didn't... <clears throat> I guess this first one I'm going to read is the October 3rd, 1832 edition of Baldwin's... Uh, sorry, of the London Times, so... <clears throat> but I'm not sure. Okay, it says, 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock last night, an inquisition was taken before Mr. Briggs at Wright's Hotel, Adam Street, Adelphi, on view of the body of Charles Morton Esquire, barrister at law, that means he was admitted to the temple, and uh, he, terminated his, his, he terminated his existence under the following circumstances. <clears throat> Pierce Morton of the Middle Temple, also an attorney, Esquire, brother to the, the deceased, deposed that the deceased had only returned on Sunday from Rotterdam. Now, Rotterdam, um, I believe, is in the same country that Leiden's in. Or at least at the time was the same country. 
back to the Netherlands. We also have uh, a dissenter baptismal record that really, of course, I can't prove is the same one and the same. We have a, a, a Charles Morton that was that uh, arrived with the early pilgrims, and we we have uh, somewhat of a, a dissent uh, sympathy towards dissenters in the theme of Walter Whitlock's Notes Upon the King of the Writ that Charles Morton wrote together. This kind of fits in with all that, but it's very, again, illusionary, just like everything else. <clears throat> he deceased, the deceased had only returned on Sunday from Rotterdam, where he had sojourned for the last three months. And this, of course, is in 1832, where he had sojourned for the last three months. He visited another brother at Blackwell upon his arrival, and that happens to be Edmund, and we'll find that out, and stayed with him until Sunday morning. On the day he came to town, a witness accompanied him to the above hotel where he hired apartments. The deceased, who was about 30 years of age, let's see, yes, he was 30 years of age, just a month over, is said to have been a melancholy and reserved man, and he was possessed of considerable property in Ireland and was contemplating a journey to that country. During the year 1830, witness, witness Pierce Morton, was constantly with him and on terms of intimacy. He imparted for the first time the informed attachment to a lady of title abroad. The attachment was of a violent nature and at times absorbed his entire attention. <clears throat> it so much affected him that he was incapable of discharging his duties of a magistrate in the county of Kerry in Ireland. That's a little different than what I uh, uh, Pierce Morton's magist magisterial records were in Cavan. County, from you know, Kilnacrot and Dromore, all cited as being in Cavan, so that strikes me as wrong. Uh, the, the name of the county, but Ireland not. But I could be wrong. I have yet to find anything in County Kerry. Maybe I will. That will help me know a little bit more about this Charles Morton. He said he showed witness several several showed witness several letters from the lady, and it appeared that the attachment was mutual. He had not seen her for three years, and about three months ago he left this country to, to visit her, and only returned on Sunday. He then appeared in excellent health and spirits, and exhibited to his friends several presents he had received. Witness spent Monday evening with him, and at his request bought some, brought some, him some newspapers. Witness was sent for after the melancholy occurrence, and found in the room a letter written by the deceased lady abroad in which there was not the remote not a remote not the remote allusion to the fatal act witness considered the attachment was the cause of the occurrence okay now it says edmund morton edmund morton esquire another brother <coughs> stated that the deceased stayed with him at blackwall on sunday and on the monday left him in excellent spirits on tuesday yesterday witness went to the hotel and at one o'clock rapped on the deceased apartment and received no answer at two o'clock, he, he again knocked and received no answer. He desired the porter to get in at the window, the door being fastened. His deceased brother was then discovered in a dressing, dressing gown, quite dead. A surgeon was sent for and quickly arrived. Witness was not aware that you know, was not aware of what led to the rash act. <clears throat> Mr. Skegg, the surgeon of Bedford Street, Strand stated that he, he was called in. The deceased was quite dead. There was a quantity of blood over his dressing gown, some on the floor, and some in a fowl pan, in which he had found a double-bladed knife generally used by gardeners. With the lar largest blade, the deceased had no doubt terminated his existence, so the guy says. On the right side of his neck, he discovered a deep incised wound, three inches in length, two inches in depth, the deceased eyes were very much bloodshot, which was indicative of mental anxiety. Now, I'm going to make a few comments here. Okay. Now, um, I, if, if you haven't figured this out, I, I, I like, I like figuring, I like figuring out how to solve complicated problems, and that that includes Linux, that includes genealogy, and that also includes for short stint I did a little bit of looking at Jack the Ripper which is hopelessly impossible to, to solve but I, I looked at it just to see what the evidence was and one piece of evidence that there that the coroner inquiries that were taking place um, after the deaths of, of 
Jack the Ripper's victims.